Hello world, how this app is powered by slavery, how the no-fly list itself was leaked, and the FBI have infiltrated a cybercrime gang. That's all coming up in today's roundup of cybersecurity tech news. Cybersecurity company Sophos have uncovered a campaign of fake cryptocurrency trading apps, but hidden beneath the surface of what seems like a basic scam is something a whole lot more sinister. The scam is called CryptoRom, standing for Crypto Romance, and it begins on an app like Tinder, where bad actors operating sock puppet accounts are on the hunt for lonely guys. After matching with a victim, they'll convince them that they found their soulmate, the love of their life, etc, etc. Whilst you might presume that the fake account is probably run by a low-level cybercriminal who's just bought an e-whoring course from some hacking forum, that's not the case. The rabbit hole here runs deep. After weeks, if not months, of talking with the victim, gaining their trust and building rapport, eventually the sock puppet turns the conversation to investing in crypto. How romantic. In particular, this talk of an uncle working for a financial analysis firm who recommends using a certain crypto trading app, MBM Bitscan. The app looks legit, I mean, it has good reviews, and at the end of the day, it's an app on Apple's App Store. Apple is known for their strict app review process, and so malicious iOS apps are incredibly rare, and chances are any given iOS user has never come across one. It looks and feels like a regular crypto trading app, but this is a fake interface. Upon depositing crypto, it's sent straight to the bad actor's wallet. But that's not where this ends. The trading app actually does let you make withdrawals, at least for a while. Once the victim has developed a false sense of security and makes a big enough deposit, their account is immediately frozen, and they receive a message saying that they need to make a further deposit of 20% of their account's value in order to unfreeze their account. If the victim falls for that, well, the bad actors just come up with yet more excuses for why the victim needs to deposit yet more money, and then yet more excuses and more, until the victim eventually accepts they've been swindled, or just runs out of money, and nopes out. But how does a fake app like this make its way past Apple? Well, it's actually quite simple. The app is designed to pull its interface from a server, so after the app is reviewed by Apple and deemed to be perfectly innocent, they just switch out the server with a malicious server, completely changing the app's functionality. You can actually see that the app's malicious interface looks nothing like the original interface in the App Store screenshots. That's because when the app was initially reviewed by Apple, it was disguised as a crypto price tracker, not a crypto trading platform. I said earlier that the rabbit hole here runs deep, and it sure does. The bad actor said to be behind this campaign is called Shaju Pan. They initially targeted people in China and Taiwan, but have since gone global. The group has a corporate-like structure, with the bottom of the food chain being the keyboarders. These are the guys that spend weeks, if not months on end, talking to victims every single day, building trust before the victim is eventually pointed to the malicious app. And it's reported that many of these keyboarders are victims themselves. They're often Indian citizens, lured with the promise of a lucrative tech job, before being trafficked to places like Cambodia or Thailand, where they have their passports confiscated and are trained in extortion and forced to commit fraud. A leaked training manual shows just how organized these guys are. And if they want to leave or do not follow the script, well, only bad things follow. A situation that could be accurately described as modern day slavery. Shaju Pan roughly translates to pig butchering, and well, that's what this scam is called, the pig butchering scam. And the money that bad actors are making from this scam is mind-boggling. The FBI's Internet Crime Report said that in 2021 alone, they received more than 4,325 complaints, with losses of over $429 million. And that only represents victims who reported the crime. Realistically, the number is going to be far higher, probably in the billions. The United States no-fly list, which, as its name suggests, contains the details of people considered too dangerous to be allowed to board planes, has been leaked. And no, this isn't the result of some highly sophisticated hack perpetrated by terrorists, but rather the document was found on an unsecured server wide open to the internet. And yes, it was literally called nofly.csv. The discovery was made by a security researcher who explains, like so many other of my hacks, this story starts with me being bored and browsing Shodan, 
or well, technically Zoomai. Similar to Shodan, Zoomai enables searching of internet connected devices by pretty much anything, IP, open port, or the software they're running. And in this case, our researcher was looking for exposed Jenkins servers. Jenkins being an open source automation server used for compiling projects and automating testing. After clicking through about 20 boring exposed servers with very little of any interest, she stumbled across a server containing some familiar words, ACARS, lots of mentions of crew and so on. These are aviation terms, which our hacker apparently recognized from their addiction to aviation YouTube. Unbeknownst to our researcher, she had stumbled across a server run by Commute Air, a small regional airline based in Ohio. After FTPing into it, she discovered this development server, used for testing purposes, was home to about 70 different projects, two of which were called No Fly Comparison and No Fly Comparison V2. These projects seemingly took the No Fly list and a list of the airline's employees as arguments and simply compared the two, checking that none of the employees were on the No Fly list. However, these files were nowhere to be found. But all that changed when our hacker came across some hard-coded AWS credentials, which provided access to pretty much the airline's entire AWS infrastructure, which contained test data for no-fly comparison, which included a suspiciously named no-fly or CSV, a legitimate copy of the no-fly list from 2019. At 80 megabytes in size, it contained 1.56 million rows of data. On the list are the names and aliases of people banned from boarding flights in the US. One person confirmed to be on the list was the Russian arms dealer Victor Bout, the guy recently freed in a prisoner exchange a couple months back. Our hacker gave the list to distributed denial of secrets, which is where it can be downloaded from. But given it is the no-fly list, you have to request access to it, and chances are you'll probably be denied, as it's only being made available to journalists and researchers. Now, you might expect this document to be considered top secret or confidential by the US government, but that just isn't the case. Based on how many people need access to the documents, that's impossible. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of charges, if any, our hacker faces. And as it happens, the hacker here is already in a bit of hot water with the US government. I mean, when I found this hacker had a Wikipedia page, I knew there was gonna be a bit of history here. So she was actually indicted in 2021 on unrelated charges, which seem to relate to her now seized git.rip on which she would post confidential leaked source code. However, she's a Swiss citizen living in, well, Switzerland. You'd think she'd be extradited, but apparently Swiss law prohibits the extradition of their citizens unless the person in question agrees to be extradited, which no sane person would do. So it doesn't seem like there's much prospect of our hacker facing any time for this latest hack either. We are here to announce that last night, the Justice Department dismantled an international ransomware network known as the Hive Ransomware Group. It's not often the FBI offensively goes after cybercriminals, so when it happens, it's a pretty big deal. The Hive Gang, thought to be Russian-based, appeared in June 2021. Since then, they've hacked and attempted to extort more than 1,500 victims globally, making off with more than $100 million. Now, Hive is a particularly nasty cybercrime gang. You see, many cybercriminals have what could be described as a code of ethics, pledging not to attack things like hospitals. For example, after the Lockbit gang recently ransomed a hospital, causing chaos, the gang quickly apologized, handing over the decryption keys for free and banishing the member of their group responsible for launching the attack. Whether Lockbit's reaction came from a place of actual concern for patients or that they just wanted to avoid bad press is debatable. But Hive didn't compromise on ethics and was, on occasion, happy to attack hospitals and steal patient data. Bad move because the FBI responded when seven months ago they covertly infiltrated the Hive network. Whether this was a hack or if some disgruntled member on the inside gave them access, we just don't know. But it resulted in the FBI gaining persistent access to Hive's backend. And they probably couldn't have believed their luck when they discovered that Hive's servers were located in California of all places. So shutting this gang down would have been as easy as filing a warrant. But the FBI didn't do that. Instead, they stayed quiet, monitoring Hive systems for seven months, secretly stealing decryption keys and providing them to more than 300 of Hive's victims, saving $130 million in ransom payments. 
though they had to call it a day at some point, and just days ago, a warrant was filed for that server in California, resulting in the seizure of the group's dark web site. A massive W, you would think. And I mean, yeah, sure, this is the longest the FBI has stayed behind enemy lines in a ransomware gang, but seemingly the only real W here was providing those decryption keys to victims, because whilst the gang has been shut down, on paper at least, there were no arrests, no one was charged, and as far as we know, the FBI still has no idea who's behind the group. So this is less of a takedown and more of a setback, as no doubt the miscreants will regroup and re-emerge a few months from now under a completely different name. But I guess that's just the nature of cybercrime at this point. However, in a bid to tempt anyone out of the shadows who is aware of the identity of those behind Hive, the US has put a $10 million bounty on these guys via the Rewards for Justice program. But coincidentally, the very next day, the Rewards for Justice website was actually blocked in Russia by the government censor, the Roskomnadzor. Though the new bounty and the block probably aren't related. I mean, at the same time, Russia also blocked the CIA and FBI websites on grounds they were spreading fake news about the Russian military and discrediting them. And besides, there is a tour version of the site if anyone does want to come forward. This video was made possible by Octopart, a website I've been relying on over the last few years in my electronics business. Octopart.com is essentially your component sourcing Swiss Army knife, making it simple to keep tabs on component stock levels in real time throughout a range of distributors, which is pretty important given the current component supply situation. You can also easily grab data sheets and CAD models for components when you need them. The best part is, it's free to use, and Octopart is integrated right into Altium 365. If you want to give Altium a go, you can find your free trial link in the description. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Have a good one.